Hi, I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our second week discussing one of Ireland's most famous writers, and that would be the great poet and Nobel Prize winner, William Butler Yeats. Last week, we discussed the author's early life uh, to some degree, and as best as an American can... <laughs> There's dis- that disclaimer. <laughs> yes. Uh, we discussed the events of the Easter Uprising and the poem, Easter 1916. That poem is widely considered to be the greatest political poem written in the English language. And today we move forward to another poem, the poem from which Achebe pulled the title of his famous book, Things Fall Apart. It's also a political poem, but not in the very specific sense of specifically talking about a specific event. Did I say that word I enough? I think it's not specific <laughs> enough. This one's abstract, and interestingly enough, a poem that generation after generation has found to be apocalyptic, predicting the end of the world in their generation. <laughs> There you go. I mean, that's kind of a dark thing to say. I mean, what do you mean by that? Well, let me give you an example, and then we can, I'm sure you have some too. But on September 23, 1968, a writer by the name of Joan Didion made a name for herself by writing about the counterculture of the United States, specifically her experiences in San Francisco. She wrote what today is a famous essay titled Slouching Towards Jerusalem. And that phrase, yes, she pulled from this poem from W.B. Yeats. Her essay wasn't about, though, Ireland or World War I or II or anything like that. It was about the crumbling of American society of the 1960s. And I want to read what she was saying about the 1960s because what I think you might see is, Wow, that is every generation (laughs) at one point. Okay, this is Joan Didion's essay, the beginning of it. The center was not holding. It was a country of bankruptcy notices and public auction announcements and commonplace reports of casual killings and misplaced children and abandoned homes and vandals who misspelled even the four-letter words they scrawled. It was a country in which families routinely disappeared, trailing bad checks and repossession papers. Adolescents drifted from city to torn city, sloughing off both the past and the future as snakes shed their skins. Children who were never taught and would never now learn the games that had held society together. People were missing. Children were missing. Parents were missing. Those who were left behind filed dulcitory missing person reports, then moved on themselves. It was not a country in open revolution. It was not a country under enemy siege. It was the United States of America in the year 1967, and the market was steady, the GMP high, and a great many articulate people seemed to have a sense of high social purpose, and it might have been a year of brave hopes and national promise, but it was not, and more and more people had the uneasy apprehension that it was not. All that seemed clear was that at some point we had aborted ourselves and butchered the job, and because nothing else seemed so relevant... I decided to go to San Francisco. San Francisco was where the social hemorrhaging was showing up. San Francisco was where the missing children were gathering and calling themselves hippies. When I first went to San Francisco, I did not even know what I wanted to find out. And so I just stayed around a while and made a few friends. (laughs) Well, her prediction, uh, the the rumors of our demise were off by a bit. But I can kind of understand what she's talking about. I mean, I've seen all those movies myself. Of course. And some of that could be said about the world in 2021. Uh, Is that what Yates describes in the poem that we're going to read? Well, I think so, because like Achebe, Didion found her current moment in the words of W.B. Yeats as he was describing post-World War I, because it was metaphor. It was a metaphor. And somehow, although the poem really is painfully confusing, as you'll see when we start reading it, somehow, through the confusion, we still are able to understand the metaphors. The second coming by the way, is actually one of the most 
quoted poems in the world. Well, at least the English language part. I'm not going to speak to anything else. It's in everything. It's in the musical realm. It's in the art realm. It's not just in one country. The South African band Urban Creek quotes it. It's quoted in the 2009 version of Batman. And of course, it's famously referenced in the final season of The Sopranos, where the anguished A.J. Soprano reads it during an attempted suicide, prompting his mother to ask, what kind of poem is that to teach college students? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So well, I want to mention uh, that I've heard it quoted a lot in the context of politics. In uh, 2016, the Wall Street Journal put this headline out. Terror, Brexit, and U.S. election have made 2016 the year of Yates. <laughs> But back to the 60s, did you know that 1968, Robert F. Kennedy warned, indeed, we seem to fulfill the vision of Yates. So anytime you need an end of the world apocalyptic, everything's He's your gonna, man. <laughs> if it's going to crash and burn, we need to quote Yates. Well, everyone sees the end of the world in this poem. It specifically identifies and pinpoints so many reoccurring problems that we worry about. The rupture of family the deconstruction of traditional societal structures, the loss of collective faith, and with that, a collective sense of purpose. And even though Yeats had specific events in mind when he wrote the poem, he deliberately revised it over and over for the purpose of making it vague enough and religious sounding enough so that it could be applied for all time. I kind of think it's nice to see it both ways, to understand that this is how he felt about the world between the world wars, even though he didn't know that there was going to be a, 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 yeah. a sequel. And But then again, knowing that Yates completely knew that this was not something that was a one and done or that it could be universalized and this was coming back. So to get a sense of what Yates was thinking when he wrote it, let's climb on the back of Pegasus. And fly back to Yates' day and take a look at what that world was looking like. <laughs> well, that sounded poetical. Are you competing with Yates now? Do you think I have a chance? <laughs> Pegasus is on my mind because, you know, we just referenced him in that last poem. But as you recall, when we left Yates last episode, he was distraught because of the executions of the 16 leaders of the Easter Uprising of 1916. And he published the poem, Four years later, still questioning whether the sacrifices that were made, the sacrifices of human life, was worth it. And he coined that phrase, terrible beauty, acknowledging the tragedy of the loss of life, but admiring the sense of commitment and love that would inspire someone to lay down their life for their beliefs, for their ideals, for their vision for the future. And to add to that, he even honored the drunkard, vainglorious lout. <laughs> to use his words. <laughs> John McBride, uh, the, the man who had abused Maud Gone, the woman that Yates loved, because McBride was one of the martyrs of the event. And so it takes us, what, five minutes to get to Maud Gone? <laughs> yes, less. It's, you just can't go anywhere talking about Yates without eventually landing on her. It's just inevitable. Their stories are that intertwined, and it's so fascinating and interesting love infatuation. It really is. Uh, and even though it's psychologically fascinating for many reasons, um, I think the new love interest of this week perhaps is even more interesting than Maude Gone. Uh, if that sounds even possible, I mean, <laughs> how about his marriage to the lovely and brilliant George Yates? Well, first of all, she is lovely and brilliant. And let's do talk about Georgie. That was her original name before she changed it to George. First of all, like every other Yates woman, she was brilliant. They met in 1911 at the library, hmm. <laughs> but somehow later connected with George's best friend. We've heard this name before, William's former girlfriend, Olivia Shakespeare. Uh, Yates was actually George's sponsor in this secret society that they were both a part of called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. It's quite famous, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love the secret society. Uh, it was famous. It was also famous for being a bit shady in its practice of magic. 
Yes, and I do want to talk about that, but I'm not through describing George because she's impressive. She was fluent in French, German, and Italian, very well educated, had a job, was beautiful, well traveled, volunteered for the Red Cross, and not to mention, as a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, her motto and magic name was Nemo, because that means no man. <laughs> So was she against men? I don't know what to think about that. Uh, I just thought it was interesting. So gone, her good friend famously said that George had a little wildness about her. So maybe it's the wildness thing going on. I don't know. Yates's motto, by the way, in that same society was D-E-D-I. Demon es Deus inversus. Or demon is the inverse of God. <laughs> I don't know hmm. what to make of that. Uh, Gary, tell us a little bit about this organization that had, we're going to see, had such an an incredibly important influence on both the Yates and and their work, specifically the poem we're getting ready to read. Well, I can't. Like I said, it's a secret. (laughs) You'd have to, we'd have have to kill us if you told us. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Uh, We do know it gave instruction and initiated people into occult practices. And um, there were 10 levels you could go through. The last three were only attainable through a magi who supposedly had supernatural wisdom and magical powers. And Yates was an active member for 36 years, and he made it to level six, by the way. Oh, my. The year he made level six was coincidentally the year he met George. Well, their love story is not one of the more romantic love stories I've ever heard. (laughs) Yates, at age 51 proposed yet again to Maud Gone. Give it up. He was rejected yet again. So he took that advice and proposed to Isolt, her daughter. And she declined, which I have to explain. At first when I read that, I thought that's got to be a joke, but it wasn't. It was a serious proposal. And he had this relationship with Isolt and was very serious about wanting to marry her. However, a month after that rejection... He proposed to George, her really good friend. Hmm. And George incredibly accepted. A month after the proposal, they went down to the government registry office with their good friend and Olivia's husband, Ezra Pound. That They went with him and George's mother to be witnesses, and they got married. That's not even a very romantic wedding. Hmm. But Yates described George like this. This is the worst. I think this girl, both friendly, serviceable, and very able. That's an awful way to describe her. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really is. Uh, George was simply infatuated with this famous man and was willing to accept uh, that she wasn't his first choice. As or pit- second. As pitiful as that is. Uh, her mother said this. She is under the glamour of a great man 30 years older than herself with a talent for lovemaking. No one wants their mother to say something like that. No, not a good recommendation. <laughs> well, with that description, it also may not surprise you that the wedding or the marriage had a bit of a rough start. <laughs> On their honeymoon, William was writing letters to Esalt, and George knew what he was doing. And we know this because she writes this phrase in a language that she knew her husband couldn't read. Per diamandera perche no siamo infelice, which means to ask why we are unhappy. That doesn't make Yates look very good at all. No, I I think it was a bit of a low point (laughs) for them. Uh, But for the rest of us, it was the beginning of an incredible literary partnership. And the reason I even mention it, besides the fact that it's incredibly interesting, is that it connects very specifically to this poem. So on this honeymoon, there is this moment where things change. Uh, Things aren't going well. George and William are stuck in the hotel, the Ashdown Forest Hotel. The wedding, well, I keep saying the wedding, but there was no wedding. The honeymoon is pretty much a disaster. And then George pulls this move, uh, which seems a little bizarre to me, but uh, works out. And again, I'm not a member of a magic occult practicing society, so I would never have thought of this. But what she does alters the course of their lives, both professionally 
and personally, and if I haven't built it up enough, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah, this is what she does. She begins to fake automatic writing in order to entertain and captivate this new husband of hers. Mm-hmm. So just to clarify, automatic writing for the rest of us who are also not members <laughs> of a secret uh, magical occult society. It's an occult practice where a person receives communications from a spirit. They write down what the spirit says. Uh, this is something that generally happens in seances, often, you know, involuntarily. And uh, some people today call it channeling or receiving spirits from the invisible realm. Yes. And, and then, of course, writing it down. And I'm assuming it's something that probably happened maybe all the time. I don't know, in the order of the golden dawn. But regardless, George started writing down these things. And this is what William said about it years later. What happened or what came in disjointed sentences in almost in illegible writing was so exciting, sometimes so profound, that I persuaded her to give an hour or two day after day to the unknown writer, and after some half a dozen hours offered to spend what remained of life explaining and piecing together these scattered sentences. No, was the answer. We have come to give you metaphors for poetry. That's the spirits talking. (laughs) Oh, good spirit voice. Uh, It's incredible, really, when you think about the time they invested in this. They participated in 450 sessions of automatic writing. It really is, and it produced an incredibly large body of work. Over the next few years, William and George produced, get this, three thousand six hundred pages of scripts he would write questions she would write answers that's basically how men and women really (laughs) know but it's really a bit of a mystery to me uh what all was going on i mean was she faking it the whole time was she channeling it the whole time is it a little bit of each and i'm not sure people really agree to what degree george was manipulating him or if this was something real. I mean, it's clear, and this is true too, that the spirits were always encouraging William to do things that were nice for her. Like, well, how <laughs> But how it's lovely. also clear, and she claimed that she really believed she was talking to dead people. So the general record suggests that she started off by faking it, but in the process of faking it, unexpectedly a spirit actually possessed her body i don't know uh but that's what people the majority of people are saying at any rate the end result was a book that they called a vision and it's basically a collection of everything that came out of these sessions 10 years that's exhausting to Mm, me mm, mm. of sessions if they had written it today We'd probably say that it was co-authored and she would have gotten a byline. But as it is now, her name is not on the book. And it is a book and it's written by him. But why this book matters at all is because in the book, the Yeatses develop and explain an entire worldview about the end of the world and how human history is organized and has been organized The Yates create this metaphor about gyres and explain how history is basically a series of gyres, which when I read that, I immediately had to go to Wikipedia and try to figure out what a gyre (laughs) Uh was. I'd never heard of that before. But the entire system of history shows how the world unfolds and progresses, and they've got it all worked out and explained in great detail. But the book, this, and, you know, we don't need to know all of their musings about you know, life and philosophies about the end of the world. But the poem, The Second Coming, is kind of the Cliff Notes version of a part of this masterpiece. Hmm. So does he get these philosophies from other religions, like from Christianity or Judaism or mythology? Yes, yes, (laughs) yes. Yes to all the above. (laughs) I mean, he studied everything. He studied Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity and all kinds of different versions of animism, not just the Irish one. But honestly, the the product, the end version is none of that. It's their very own thing. Different ideas kind of collected and coming from different places. And the poem, The Second Coming, 
describes the vision he sees surrounding the end of the 20th century. So knowing that he thinks that the world as the Christian era of the world as we know it is ending, uh, he thinks this and then he sees these events and they kind of prove to him that his philosophy that he's been creating and receiving from these spirits is actually true. So Gary, let me ask you this. If you were around in 1919 in January and you're reading all this stuff about the end of the world and you're getting these messages and then you look out and read the newspapers of what's going on uh, and these things affirm your feelings, what would you be reading about? <laughs> <laughs> hmm, well, uh, you That's know, a lot, I'm sure. It is. Nobody can blame anyone for thinking the, the end of the world was coming if they're living in Europe, specifically in Ireland in 1919. As we've talked about at length, the uh, First World War had just ended, and there's no way we people of today could ever understand the toll that that took on people who lived through it. Uh, just the loss of life, the destruction of property, the violent carnage committed by everyday people for, for the most non-understandable of reasons. I mean, the dark side of the human soul of Every human seemingly was exposed uh, just in the war, but the war isn't the only thing. Right after that comes the Russian Revolution. Uh, the czars obviously had been cruel leaders, and the socialists promised to bring fairness and justice for the common man. But as we know, that promise of everyone sharing wealth together never materialized. Uh, as always happens when dealing with humans, greed and power really are just too much. And uh, the aftermath of the revolution was bloody. Beyond bloody, it resulted in mass starvation at the hands of men uh, who people had really believed to be their saviors. And the socialist system created an opportunity for totalitarianism to emerge. And and uh, it did not just in Russia, but most notably so. And But it wasn't just disillusionment with the Bolsheviks. I mean, the Irish independence was proving uh, to be not without its share of violence and disillusionment and corruption and everything else that Achebe identified uh, during his independence experience. So, yeah, 1919, <laughs> not a good year. Well, and I, I really think if I were Achebe living through something like that in, in my context in Nigeria, it would be a, a great place to look for a parallel or for some understanding. It's not surprising that... This is the poem from which he pulls out, you know, the title of his book and this metaphor of the gyre. But, Gary, I've referenced it now a couple times. Explain to us what the heck is a gyre. That's kind of a science word. That's okay. well out of my realm. We, we're going to wade into it. Uh, <laughs> and it is complicated. But basically, um, think of a tornado spiral. And then think of two tornado spirals. <laughs> One is... Uh, right side up, the other one upside down, uh, creating this triangle in the tornado. Yates saw history divided into a 2,000-year tornado spiral. Uh, each era always moving and twisting, but one era ending smaller with the tornado spiral ending up on the inside of the top of a second tornado. I know, that's hard yeah. to visualize, but I think I can. In other words, one tornado kind of collapsing into a new one that's beginning. So um, he saw the birth of Christ as beginning one spiral, but sadly by 1918, that 2,000 years is up and another spiral is starting to emerge. And in his mind, uh, the end of the 2,000 year cycle is chaotic and from inside the chaos births another one. How's that? Well, with that in mind, let's read the poem and see if we can understand it. Let's just start by the beginning. Stanza one. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the sinner cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I still think of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, and because <laughs> of the, so? the tornadoes and the oh. spirals and getting caught up, and I can see the the falcon and the falconer. But so he mentions the widening gyre tornado, and in the tornado you can see that's what I mean. You can see this falconer guy sending out his falcon, but in the chaos the falcon gets too far away. 
and the from the falconer because the gyres are interacting and the falcon can't hear the falconer giving instructions and and he can't get back and things go badly things fall apart the center that has been holding things up together is upset with this new upheaval of forces and the new world order descends upon the old one but this results in anarchy and there's Tides of blood everywhere and innocence is drowning and bad people are winning and good people are giving up. It's a lot of bad stuff in one single sentence he threw in there. <laughs> yeah, packs in a lot. And I want to point out that the entire sentence, well, the entire stanza is exactly one sentence. It's one single thought. So all of that swirling and twisting and chaos and blood and innocence drowning and the next era doesn't seem to be emerging with great leadership. <laughs> no, and of course he's he's describing World War One and the technology that for the first time had the power to destroy life on a scale that had never been possible before. And he's also talking about um, the technology that allows single humans the power to control others in ways they'd never been able to control them before. And um, he sees that the people who rise to the top are not the good people, but the ruthless power mongers who will do almost anything to accomplish their self-serving goals. Would that be a fair estimation of... That's exactly right, and it's nightmarish. And of course, that's not enough. He doesn't want to stop there. The next two sentences, they're not the entire stanza, but we should talk about them. He says this, Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming! Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it reels shadows of the indignant desert birds. So the first thing that strikes you, obviously, if you're familiar with Christianity, is all these references to the second coming, except you can tell that it's ironic. He's not using the term the second coming the way Christians would use it, because for Christians, that's a good thing. The second coming is Christ, and he's not bringing chaos. He's bringing order. He's bringing peace, and it's a wonderful thing. When Christ returns to earth, there's peace, prosperity, fairness, justice, love, nothing that we see in this <laughs> poem at all. So it's clear, clearly sarcastic. What is coming here is obviously worse than what already existed. This is the exact opposite of the Christian vision for the future because He's saying, oh, yeah, there's a second coming for sure. But the second coming brings worse things, not better ones. Wow. Well, true. Uh, uh, but let's not jump over this idea of the Spiritus Mundi. I knew you'd jump on that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it fascinates me that Yates references that because he's a, a little bit ahead of his time on this topic. And So Carl Jung, one of my favorites who I've mentioned uh, many times because of his work with archetypes, and I'd also like to point out I have a Carl Jung finger puppet. <laughs> Just FYI. Anyway. Uh, uh, the fact that somebody markets that. Yes. <laughs> and there's someone to buy it. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so uh, Jung believed uh, in this this idea that, that humanity shared a collective consciousness. And he believed that we were hardwired with um, certain stories and symbols already pre-programmed into our beings. And really, it's fascinating. And Jung would say, it's no coincidence that the Cinderella story exists in all cultures throughout all time. It's hardwired into our brains, as was the symbolism behind the colors uh, red, black, white, and green in the number three. Exactly. And although Yates didn't know the term collective unconscious, that's exactly what he's talking about when he's using these words or that phrase, spiritus mundi. That means spirit of the world. It's this vast image as he understood it. So the story is there. It's no accident that it isn't named. He's making us go back into our own subconscious. And he's saying, you know, this beast It's in your mind. It's in our collective story. I don't even have to talk about it. It's scary, but you already know about it. It's a scary figure that's embedded in 
the collective unconscious in the spiritus mundi, this common memory that we all have. Uh, he's going to identify, you know, it's there in different mythologies. There's the same beast that shows up at Yates found it in all these other cultures. And he references it. And we can guess, well, we might can guess that he's talking about a sphinx or a man of core because we recognize, you know, this creature from Greek or Egyptian mythology, but he's going to say it's in our brains. If he's thinking of that, we can imagine uh, the human head on the lion body that looms over Giza in Egypt. And that one is in the desert. I would say um, it's incredibly large, 66 (laughs) feet or 20 meters high. And I would say that would be quite horrifying if that thing got up and moved. (laughs) I would move out of the way. Uh, Yeah. And the other option would be the manticore, which isn't quite as large, but also is horrifying. And maybe it is part of the same image because it also has a beast with the body of a lion, although usually red. And the manticore has the tail of a scorpion, but it also has the face of a man with a mouth filled with multiple rows of sharp teeth like a shark. And the manticore is said to be able to shoot spikes from its tail or mane and paralyze prey. It can be horned, winged, or both. So no matter how you want to visualize the beast, uh, because Yates isn't specific which one he's actually talking about. We can see this figure, and Yates would say, I don't have to describe it any more than that because it's in this collective memory that we all have, and so we can easily see it in our mind's eye as I just reference it walking across the desert. But where is it headed? <laughs> uh. Let's keep reading. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, it's hour come around at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. And there's all that Christian imagery again. It's headed, as in the sphinx or beast or whatever that is, it's headed toward Jerusalem. That's the center of three major world religions. Bethlehem is right outside of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is where Christ was born. It's been asleep for 20 centuries. In other words, the age of Christ. But the age of Christ is being supplanted, and it's being supplanted by something different. And the way that it reads, it might even be something older. Something older than the age of Christianity is supplanting it. Yates later wrote this, All our scientific, democratic, fact-accumulating, heterogeneous civilization belongs to the outward gyre and prepares not the continuance of itself, but the revelation as in a lightning flash. So in other words, all the things that we associate with our current Christian era, he defines democracy, pursuit of truth through scientific discovery, heterogeneous civilization, All of that is on the way out. Something else is on the way in. But unlike the second coming of Christ as defined in the book of Revelation in the Bible, Yates predicts the second coming as a nightmare. The wording is ambiguous enough. It could be anything. (laughs) And that is where the power is from. Uh, when the stories we've based our world on no longer work, you know, society melts into war with each other. And in every generation, uh, there lur- lurks fear that um, society's stories are losing their ability to communicate some shared values. And once we cannot communicate with each other, we also cannot sense the world and the, the center begins to break. And we start quoting Yates. Yes, we do. <laughs> Be it America, Ireland, Nigeria, or any other part of the world where this poem is read. Well, I'd like to say we're ending on a high note, but uh, Yeats wants that beast to loom. And so he does. But I will say that his life did not end under the shadow of a looming sphinx for whatever he says. He and George went on after that nightmarish honeymoon to have two children. He became a political figure in the new Irish Free State. He was a senator for six years. The year after that, he won the Nobel Prize in Literature. 
the Nobel Committee said they gave it to him for his always inspired poetry, which in a highly artistic form gives expression to the spirit of a whole nation. And of course, that's definitely true. But Yeats himself always believed that the Nobel Committee was not just acknowledging his work, but the advent of this new national literary heritage, the literature of Ireland. So another fun fact to end on, because I think that's kind of a positive note. Yates purchased a castle <laughs> hmm. for the nominal sum of 35 pounds. And he was enchanted by it. And the name of it is Thor Bally Lee. He, George, and the kids would live there in the summers. And he thought of it as his monument and as his symbol. The tower was originally from the 15th century. But he spent years working with an architect to restore it. And the Yates Thor Bally Lee Society since then has further renovated it and restored it. And one day, when we finally get to make our trip to (laughs) Ireland, I want to go see that sucker. It's one of everyone's places to go if I read when they go there. So why do I say that? All this talk of doom and gloom and beasts across the desert If we do as we are taught by Yeats and watch what people believe by what they do and not necessarily by what they say, I would say that a man who builds a tower or restores a tower has some hope for the future because he left a landmark by which we could remember him. Just a thought. <laughs> well, and so the world has. What a fun idea, Christy. Should we buy ourselves a castle? Well, in Memphis, we might have to settle for a rice dryer. <laughs> okay, the rice dryer. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for listening. Um, next week, we are moving to Norway, not literally. Metaphorically. Metaphorically. And we're exploring the theater of Henry Ibsen uh, in his play, A Doll's House. That'll be fascinating. So thanks again for being with us. Uh, follow us on our social media. Check out our webpage, howtolovelitpodcast.com. And... Tell a friend. Peace out.